I think I particularly like um, the, the marvellous definition of translation as an intersecting category, which Bella Brodsky promotes in her book, that um, translation, we need to think about translation as we have come to think about gender as a category, as something without which basically we can't engage in textual analysis. Translation studies, the, the disadvantage of translation studies as a term is that, um, and I mean I've, I've said this and I would say it again unashamedly, too many people have decided to define themselves as translation studies experts and box themselves in. I think when you when you try to establish a new field and you start writing to one another and speaking to one another, there's a real danger that you, you, you don't open up. I think translation studies as a field has not reached out nearly as far as it should have done. And I think that's perhaps why some of the best work in translation at the moment is being done by people who don't call themselves translation studies specialists at all. Mm. But I, I'm not worried about how I'm labelled, and I never have. I mean, mm. I wrote translation studies. I'm at present preparing the next uh, edition, the fourth edition. Um, but I mean, I just, I think I see myself as someone who's basically concerned with what I suppose you would describe as um, intercultural communication through translation, through, through literature, in whatever. And... But I do think there is, a, there is something of a problem in terms of terminology. And that has to do with the disciplinary bases within institutions that want to label this as translation and that as comp lit. And, and I mean, I'm very happy with world literature. It's a good, loose category. But somebody will come along in a while and say that's too restrictive as well. Yes, maybe that's <laughs> why, that's how <laughs> things are going, uh, going on. Yeah. But I think... Uh, but um, I was saying discipline, and I think uh, we need to speak about discipline because of all these people that have done so much to, to, to create a discipline. Oh, yes. Uh, so, and it has been defined and it has been identified as a discipline. Uh, you can see it positively or negatively, but uh, now it's, I think we need to, s to, 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 uh, to make a new step further. Um, maybe it was important to call it discipline and identify with the discipline to really uh, start to fly. But now yeah. that we are flying, maybe we don't need it anymore and it's too restrictive. Yeah, I think possibly to give it respectability, to yes, make it respectable. Yes, yeah. So now translation studies is respectable, mm. but, and I can't emphasize this too strongly, translation studies from the beginning was a contestatory was uh, Evan Zohar, Lefebvre and myself, all of us, we were protesting against what we saw as restrictions. And so my concern is what happens, if you want to call it a discipline, what happens when a discipline becomes very respectable? Uh, it has to be challenged by someone. It's too old. Because it's change mm. never comes from the establishment. Change comes from the margins, mm. from people saying, we're not happy with that. And so what I would like to see is a whole load of people saying, we're not happy with translation studies at the moment. It's got too conservative. It's too narrow in focus. Let's do something else. We are trying <laughs> with our journal. Uh, <laughs> time will show. And we are calling this project uh, post-translation studies. Hmm. Do you think we it could work? Well, we've had, we had feminism and post-feminism, and we had structuralism and post-structuralism. Post-translation... I mean, part of the problem with post-translation studies is, is that translation is still at the centre of things. I mean, I know we've, we've talked with various people about is there another way of um, getting beyond the very word translation? And I mean, one of the things that comes out in, in the book that Espy Bielsa and I did is how, how few of the people doing what we would call translation in the news, call themselves translators. They call themselves international journalists. And I have a student at the moment who is doing a super PhD on um, advertising 
in particular in the, 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 the automotive industry in England and Italy. And again, when she looks at advertising agencies, they don't want to call themselves translators. So there's a kind of difficulty around the very notion of, of the word translation. So maybe post-translation is sufficiently provocative for now, but I don't think it's, mm. I don't think it's going to be... I can't imagine a discipline of post-translation. No, of course, it's, that's not uh, the, the idea, of course. But I think uh, maybe in some areas the, 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 the concept of translation or the word translation doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But wh when you go into other disciplines, ex especially in this historical period, uh, you see that the word translation is used as a more or less a metaphor, oh, yeah, but absolutely. it's very very strong. It's a yeah. very very useful concept yeah. no, to speak about today, yes. what is happening today, about borders, yeah. about this new globalized, uh, fragmented world. It's yeah. a very powerful f metaphor. Very much so, and I mean, so far that, that a number of people, I mean, I think in, in a, a recent issue of, of, of the journal translation studies, I think Doris Bachmann-Medic, who was um, editing that issue, has talked about a translational turn in literary yes. studies. Um, and I think that's actually quite an interesting idea, that there is, that you're quite right, translation has been used as a metaphor, it is something, it, it, is, it is a hot topic. But I think we have to be aware that translation as a hot topic is not necessarily translation studies as no. a hot topic. No, so I agree, I agree. No, so th that's the concept, yeah. not translation studies. The concept, mm. the translation concept, yes. absolutely. Mm. And that has to do, as I say, with, with what I see as not just epistemological shifts, but also actual socio-political shifts, which epistemological shifts obviously come as a result of, of, mm. of those mm. other changes. Mm. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you have uh, written a, a new book. It came out uh, this year. In June. In June, June this year. 2011. Reflections yeah. on Translation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, a book with 39 essays, I think, mm -hmm. and they were have been published over... Pieces of journalism, yes. yes, over 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Could you select maybe one of them and read something for, for us? Or do you want to say something about this book yeah, first? The, 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 book, um, the book came about because, as I say, I had been uh, writing these columns for two journals, for two professional journals. One, The Linguist, which is the um, Institute of Linguists uh, monthly publication, and the other, the Institute of Translators and Interpreters Bulletin. And it's been absolutely liberating because I've been allowed to write about anything that I wanted to. So I could write about translating menus. Um, I could write about the debate between theory and practice. I could write personal things, translating to theater. So I've been able to write about all sorts of things. But the one little bit that I think I would like to read is about, it's a topic that is very dear to my heart. I think it's a very important topic. And that is about something I was talking about earlier, the, the need for us to trust translators and the immense danger involved in translation. And this essay was triggered by the incredibly brutal murder of some translators and interpreters in Afghanistan by the Taliban who, who had their tongues cut out and were murdered. Um, and it struck me thinking how many times through the ages people had been burned to death and executed and so on because of translation. And so it's a, a topic I keep coming back to again and again. And I, I, if I can just read one um, little tiny, two little tiny bits from this really, and one is this. Language is powerful. There is an old English saying which goes Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. This is simply nonsense. Words can wound more sharply than knives. And as can be seen by the death threats issued to translators through the ages, translation, whether of a written text or an oral interpretation, can be punishable by death in some contexts. 
We have always needed translators and interpreters, especially in times of conflict and international antagonisms. Wars are fought with weapons, but peace treaties are made with words. And without men and women who seek to diffuse tensions and misunderstandings by bringing the enlightenment of mutual comprehension to the table, the shaping of such treaties would be impossible. The brutal murder of the Afghan interpreters serves to show us all how vital interlingual communication is if we want to create a better world and how badly we all need brave people capable of facilitating that communication. The risks they take are huge because they're dealing not only with the hostilities of a particular conflict, but with deep-seated psychological fears of otherness, fears that stem from the terrible power of a language that is unknown to us, outside of us, and belonging to other people who may be our enemies. Translators and interpreters who have the courage to face down those fears in their day-to-day -day work deserve our respect and admiration. And that, for me, is really why translation 